right. Powder keg. Yeah. Powder keg, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the, we've got photographs of uh, tank farms exploding, you know. Smoke everywhere. Yeah, it's very dramatic. <laughs> well, I hope they have better luck than we did last time on Air March. I thought after the last march it was finished. You know, yeah. I really thought it was. Yeah. Because we closed out all of Hastings Street. Yeah. And uh, the natives had the drums going and we were walking down the street, stopping all the town. And all of a sudden this big eagle comes. Right, and right. And just circled us yeah. the whole way. You know? I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I guess the natives must have called it. Maybe, maybe they thought we had some food, you know. Just out of 5,000 people, maybe if somebody had some food. You know? <laughs> oh, no, no, the natives called them. You have to, you have to, you have, to have that, that mythology or yeah. truth or idea. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's good luck. So with this Kimmer Morgan, Trudeau is wanting to, he's pushing it, right? Oh, really? Yeah, he's pushing it. Yeah, he's pushing it. Um, <laughs> a couple contradictory things he said in the campaign. One was he said that he didn't want Northern Gateway to Kitimat, but he did want Kimmer Morgan. But he also said, uh, governments grant permission, but, no, governments grant permits, but only communities can grant permission. So Burnaby doesn't want it, Vancouver doesn't want it, First Nations don't want it. So, yeah. Well, he's contradictory in a lot of things. Well, yeah, there's some of the some of the shine is wearing off. <laughs> Yeah, they figure, oh, well, we apply. National Energy Award is on our side, so we'll just do it. You know? Of course, a lot of people here are going to vote for it. A lot of people are slowing them down. They're saying every delay is a victory. I have a friend who went to the lady in the morning. I know it had lots of people with the Yes, I'm not going to 
morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Sorry. Do I know you? Where is it? 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 Where
But I travel to the I hope you all have an order of service. If we have a reading in the order of service. It's a responsive reading. We light this fire, symbol of the warmth of community, symbol of the light within us, which leads to truth and meaning, symbol of the wisdom which shines down through the ages, symbol of action and the fire of commitment within us. So in your order of service, there's actually another sheet there if you need larger print, is our, one of our favorite songs, our, my favorite song, Hymn number 1028. Um, it was written in 1961. The words were written by Catherine Morin and put to music in 1972 by Jason Shelton, who's a Unitarian. And uh, so we're gonna, what we're going to do is play that song. And I suggest we play, we listen to how he's, he'll sing alone the first verse. And then the choir, the choir kind of comes in and sings the second verse. So you can, you'll read along these verses. You'll come in kind of with the choir. Since our mind and soul 
prophetic voice, which demands a deeper justice, built by armor rages choice. When the fire of the midland sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion need to call. and concerns um, and sorrow. So today uh, I would like to light a candle for Philip Hewitt, Minister Emeritus at the Unitarian Church of Vancouver, who is actually the person who drew Dale into the Unitarian movement in, the, in Vancouver. And Philip Hewitt was one of the founders of the Wilderness Camp. He, along with Robert Fulgram of uh, kindergarten, what we learned in kindergarten fame, and two other Unitarian ministers had the vision back in the 50s to buy, um, I think, 137 acres of land around Fry Creek and Covenant. Is that correct amount? I'm not sure. I think it's 137 it's Over 100 acres. acres. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and covenant it to be a wilderness camp. And that camp has been used by Unitarians and others for years and years and years. And I have the joy of saying that Philip came up and did his shakedown tour with Carl at our place, and we all went up to wilderness, and he led a hike when he was 90 years old, up Fry Creek. Philip had a terrible stroke last weekend and died on Wednesday. It's a big loss to the Unitarian movement. He wrote several books, um, some historical and some deeply spiritual to let people know about what Unitarianism is all about. And we have at least one of those books here in our collection. So um, that candle is for Philip. Joys and concerns. Anyone have a joy or a concern they want to share today? Well, you've inspired me because I, I've, I've met, I met Philip Hewitt several times, and he's an extraordinary gentleman. But the first time I met him was at the Unitarian Church in Edmonton, and he came to a service there, and he was offered to do whatever part of the service he wanted to do. So he did this story for the children. <laughs> it was really good. He was a special man, and he contributed to hugely to, uh, to our community. I want to say a thank you to Philip Hewitt for his life. We used to live in Vancouver and then go to the Methodist Church, but we heard about Philip and then they didn't have the church then. We went to a little old church on 10th on Avenue. 10th Avenue, yes, thank you, Marcia. For a while then we built this beautiful new church. And it's been going strong ever since with Philip at the helm. And he's an amazing, was an amazing person. And we're very thankful for his life. Thank 
anyone else have a joy or a concern about Philip or anything else? And I had a joy to see you back here. Oh, thank you, Marcia. I'm Karen, and I am lighting uh, two candles of concern. Two of my very good friends are in the hospital, and we're trying to find out why. So this is for you, Judith, and this is for you, Glennis. Joys and concerns? And I'll just light a candle of thanks that brings Tara Bonham and Carl Perrin on their odyssey-like journey <laughs> to our town to share with us today. And this um, candle will be lit for all of the unspoken or those things that are not ready, joys and concerns of all who are here, um, that candle is for you. Okay, and uh, Tara is, um, Tara Bonham is from the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. She sits on the worship services committee there. She sings in the choir, as you heard with her beautiful voice. And, um, and she is a, a wonderful piece of the environment committee down there. And she's gonna read the story for all ages. Um, I think I'm think okay. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the story for the ages. Theodore Parker's Loaded Pistol. Among the people who used to come each Sunday to Theodore Parker's church in Boston were William and Ellen Kraft. William was a carpenter, and they had a nice home in Boston where they lived for some years. Theodore Parker knew them well and welcomed them gladly when they came to visit. He knew this true story of their past, which was kept secret from most other people in Boston, as years ago they had been held as slaves by a cruel master in Georgia. They managed to flee over 900 miles until they finally came to safety in Boston, as Massachusetts was a free state that did not allow slavery. The Crafts lived peaceful, hard-working lives in Boston until 1850, and that's the date when the United States Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law. The Fugitive Slave Law allowed slave owners to recapture former slaves who had escaped to a free state. Some of the slavery supporters decided to demonstrate this power of this new law, and they wanted to pull off a high-profile capture, so they targeted William and Ellen Kraft as, uh, for recapture. When the slave catchers came to Boston, the Committee on Vigilance, which was a group organized to stop the Fugitive Slave Law and end slavery, went into action. Theodore Parker let Ellen hide out in his own home, and he put himself at risk for a fine of $1,000 and imprisonment for six months under this new law. Parker declared to everyone, made no secret, I will help a fugitive slave as readily as I would lift a man out of the water, or pluck him from the teeth of a wolf, or snatch him from the hands of a murderer. What is a fine of $1,000 and jailing for six months to the liberty of a man? My money perish with me if it stands between me and the eternal law of God. While his wife stayed in the safety of Parker's house, William Kraft armed himself, and with the support from the Committee on Vigilance, he continued to move around Boston and keep away from the slave catchers. Then Theodore heard that the slave catchers had threatened to break into his house at night. Determined to keep them out, Parker kept a loaded pistol at the ready. A few months later, when some other Unitarian ministers criticized Parker for breaking the law, he responded unequivocally, I have in my church black men and women, fugitive slaves. They are the crown of my apostleship, the seal of my ministry. It becomes me to look after their bodies in order to save their souls. This law has brought us into the most intimate connection with the sin of slavery. 
I have been obliged to take my own parishioners into my house to keep them out of the clutches of the kidnapper. Yes, gentlemen, I have been obliged to do that, and then to keep my doors guarded by day as well as by night. Yes, I have had to arm myself. I have written my sermons with a pistol in my desk, loaded and ready for action. And yes, with a drawn sword within reach of my right hand. This I have done in Boston in the middle of the 19th century, obliged to defend the members of my own church, women as well as men. The slave catchers and the federal marshals who helped them never did break into Parker's house. He even went to their hotel and let them know that whoever came into his house to capture Ellen Craft would do so at the peril of their lives. He went on to tell them exactly what the people of Boston thought of them and what might happen to them if certain people in Boston got hold of them and so scared the slave catchers that they left the city as soon as they could catch a departing train. <laughs> there ends the story. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Carl Perrin, who I've known for many, many years at the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. He's very active in the Environment Committee, and also with Broke, which is Burnaby Residents Opposing Kinder Morgan Expansion. So I give you Carl Perrin. Thank you. So... We have some paraphernalia here. I'm going to um, start the minutes of silence, of silent meditation. Uh, please relax and settle into a few minutes of silent meditation, thinking, or prayer. Property. What is it? Theft. Freedom. Home. We meet on the unceded territory of the Senexed and Tunakwa First Nations. Unceded, what does that mean? Never conquered, never sold, never given away, never ceded to anyone. Now we'll have a few minutes of silent meditation. I'll now give you my sermon. I thought it was finished a couple days ago, but as some of you heard, we had five and a half hours on the bus waiting for a replacement in Rock Creek, and uh, I had plenty of time to look it over and scratch out things and add a couple words here and there, so I think this is the final draft, at least for today it is. Today, I am a climate change warrior. 
I'm a Unitarian. I am a seeker of the way. Who are you? Some of you have identified as Unitarian for a long time. Some are new to this combination of ancient denomination and modern movement. Some may be floating in newfound freedom. We come together in mutual support to share our joys, our sorrows, our questions, and occasionally our answers. You will change and grow as a congregation. You are a home for many personal traditions which will clash and blend, constantly living and constantly dying like any organism. You will become a village, a shelter, a sanctuary, but you will also be a force for good. Nelson and the Slocan Valley are better because you are here. This watershed, with its own interdependent web of living and dying, will grow in health and well-being because you are here. You are a home within a friendly universe, a universe which is grateful and loving to every cell of your existence. You are welcomed and welcoming. We love you, and I thank you for considering my good news. I want to tell you first about a few moments in my spiritual journey. I was born in 1945. I grew up in the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Detroit, Michigan. But for my first decade, its name was Church of Our Father. And if Our Father resonates with some of you, as in Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, you will recall that Unitarians have loved the historical Jesus and sought to rescue his teaching from institutional Christianity since the 1500s. One of our Sunday school texts in the 50s was Jesus the Carpenter's Son. The historical Jesus was raised by ordinary people like you and me, Joseph and Mary. In Sunday school, we learned love and respect giving and receiving respect, but we also learned the wonder of science. We learned the scientific story of the universe. We learned the basic value of each person. Everyone has a story. Only much later did I learn that humanity is not the pinnacle of material existence. But this was the 50s, when humanism was waxing strong in the Unitarian spectrum of belief. This was before the ecological view, when meditation, Zen, and Tibetan Buddhism were virtually unknown. The seminal book, Silent Spring, written by Unitarian Rachel Carson, had yet to be written. And our seven principles had yet to be dreamed of. In fact, our seventh principle wasn't voted in till 1984. It states, we covenant to affirm and promote the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. I, w I wish now to jump to 1965. I was visiting my home church with my Unitarian mother we had a book table during the coffee hour after church, and I bought a slender translation of an ancient Chinese text, the Tao Te Ching. Tao means the path or the way. Te means power, and Ching means text or book. So Tao Te Ching means the book of the path or the way and its power. This is a strangely modern little book from five centuries before the Common Era. The Tao Te Ching starts with its most difficult verse. Here it is. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you only see the manifestations. 
Yet mystery and manifestations arise from the same source. This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness. The gateway to all understanding. Unquote. What this means to me is that human brains from infancy are biased towards discriminating things, naming things, defining what things are and are not. But in the process of acquiring language or naming, we learn to ignore relationships. The interdependent holistic systems which keep things humming along. We are born into a cultural worldview which is like a magnifying glass with blinders. And yet, we can choose to wake up. Here's a quote from Leonard Cohen, which applies very much to me. My mind was always very cluttered, so I took great pains to simplify my environment. Because if my environment were half as cluttered as my mind, I wouldn't be able to make it from room to room. <laughs> Here in Nelson, in this watershed, you have the opportunity to participate in this amazing beauty. To open up to it with all your senses, as Henry David Thoreau did. Call it the interdependent web of all existence. Call it Gaia. Call it the unnameable. For any name would create boundaries within it, around it. Divinity is a verb, and I, uh, to paraphrase Philip Hewitt, divinity is a verb. I call it the Tao, the way, and I am both seeker and the one sought. Call it the wild, in Thoreau's sense, when he wrote in his essay, Walking, all good things are wild and free, and in wildness is the preservation of the world. Now, I have my arguments with Thoreau, but then all we have are his 19th century words. And as the Tao Te Ching says, in all humility, the person who speaks doesn't know, and the person who knows doesn't speak. <laughs> That's about halfway through the book, before it speaks on and on and on, <laughs> with more paradoxical nonsense that I love. Why do I love it? It knocks me out of my smug worldview. Which brings me to my next example of change in relativity, slavery, and those who fought against it, <coughs> the abolitionists, the anti-slavery warriors. I started this talk by saying I am a climate change warrior. Specifically, I'm willing to put my body on the line to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion but my commitment started in 1993, when I read Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance, which was about climate change. It broke my heart. But 1993 was also the summer I heard Joanna Macy, the Buddhist environmental activist. In 1993, I heard 12-year-old Severin Suzuki's speech at the UN Environment Conference in Rio de Janeiro. I remember she said, you grown-ups, if you can't fix it, please stop breaking it. <laughs> that was 1993. She's now on the board of the David Suzuki Foundation and studying Haida language at UBC. I, in 1993, I went to Clackwood Sound and to jail to stop the destruction of old-growth rainforest. In 1993, my 60s Unitarian immersion in nonviolent direct action in the Civil Rights Movement and the anti-war movement came to my rescue. My heart was broken, but I found a way to heal it. I made a vow to my son. I only told him later, but this is what I said in 1993. I will do everything in my power everything in my power to prevent your premature death at age 66 in 2050 from the collapse of civilization caused by climate change. And in 2030, when I am 85, I will say to him, I did my best. 
That's all we can ask of anyone. We do our best. Humbly, we do our best. But how? How do we stop the burning of fossil fuels? A few years ago, I read Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. She concludes by asking, when has a moral force defeated an economic success? And she comes up with one example, slavery. Specifically, the slavery which led to the U.S. Civil War. And who mounted that moral force? It was a small minority of abolitionists, mostly Quakers, including the Quaker Unitarian suffragette Susan E. Anthony. These abolitionists endured violent opposition, as well as gradualist moderation. But they eventually convinced enough Northerners that slavery was simply wrong. It took a civil war, but slavery was outlawed, long after it was outlawed peacefully in the British Empire. Today, our moral force is fighting another economic success, the fossil fuel corporations. Today, those of us committed to the Coast Protectors Pledge, signed by over 23,000 people, will do our best to stop the Kinder Morgan expansion, which, if built, would produce greenhouse gases equivalent to at least 20 million additional cars on the road every day. Canada is far from achieving Harper's paltry greenhouse gas goals, adopted by Trudeau as our inadequate Paris Agreement goals. But expanding the tar sands, the nation's biggest source of greenhouse gases, would be game over for the climate, according to NASA scientist James Hansen. So how does our ethical opposition to fossil fuels and economic success parallel the abolitionist ethical opposition to slavery? In their day, they were considered crazy radicals for opposing what was economically expedient, the reduction of human beings to the status of furniture. Listen to this quote from an early field ecologist, Aldo Leopold, who wrote it, The Land Ethic in 1948. When godlike Odysseus, Ulysses, returned from the wars in Troy, he hanged all on one rope, a dozen slave girls, whom he suspected of misbehavior during his absence. This hanging involved no question of propriety. The girls were property. The disposal of property was then, as now, a matter of expediency, not of right and wrong. Concepts of right and wrong were not lacking from Odysseus's Greece. Witness the fidelity of his wife through the long years before, at last, his black-proud galleys clove the wine-dark seas for home. The ethical structure of that day covered wives, but had not yet been extended to human chattels. During the 3,000 years which have since elapsed, ethical criteria have been extended to many fields of conduct, with corresponding shrinkages in those judged by expediency only. He continues, the first ethics dealt with the relation between individuals. The Ten Commandments is an example. Later accretions dealt with the relation between the individual and society. The Golden Rule tries to integrate the individual to society democracy to integrate social organization to the individual. There is as yet no ethic dealing with man's relation with human beings, relation to land, and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. Land, like Odysseus's slave girls, is still property. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges, but not obligations. The extension of ethics to this third element in human environment is, if I read the evidence correctly, an evolutionary possibility and an economic necessity. 
Later in this 1948 essay, Leopold outlines what he means by a land ethic. First, he says, all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instincts prompt him to compete for his place in that community, but his 